standing inside the shield of the twin six-pounder Coast Artillery gun, and we refer to this as the fastest gun in the West because it was a very modern piece of equipment put in in 1945. It could fire 72 rounds a minute. The only target it was concerned with were torpedo boats, very small, fast-moving, unarmored targets. So this gun had to be able to fire fast and also to swing or traverse quickly in order to follow those targets. Esquimalt Harbor is uh, Canada's important West Coast naval base prior to that a British base. Uh, behind us we see the twin six-pounder gun which was here in the Second World War and beyond that at the entrance to the harbor is Fisgard Lighthouse which has stood there since 1860. There'd been a flurry of new building in the 1930s to improve our defenses, to modernize them. Most of them had dated to the 1890s and were desperately in need of an upgrade. So new batteries were built in 1938-1940 period. Uh, the men who manned these batteries were a very small cadre of professional soldiers supplemented by the large militia regiment here in town who were just Saturday night soldiers as it were. They were all mobilized in August of 1939 before the war even began to head out to the forts and prepare everything for a potential attack. 1942 was probably the year that the war really started to bite right across Canada but here in the west coast in particular. Uh, rationing was introduced so it was hitting the household. Uh, as far as the coast artillery goes there was uh, a lot of work done with the air raid precautions, the ARP program. Uh, porch lights were banned in Greater Victoria. There were blackout tests done across the city. And the whole idea was to be prepared for either a, a naval or an aerial potential attack after what happened at Pearl Harbor. What we're looking at here is a Second World War searchlight emplacement. It's built of steel and concrete, but it's got a paint job and some fake wooden parts to make it look like it was a fisherman's hut. Before we had radar on the west coast of Canada, we had to use searchlights to illuminate targets at night, and this is one of them. It's a General Electric 60-inch, 800 million candle power searchlight. Some of the older soldiers used to joke with new recruits that the light was so powerful it would knock over a small boat. The boom defense consisted of a, a curtain, a steel curtain of, of interlocked rings that literally hung in the water like a big set of curtains as a torpedo net. It was not to stop submarines, but rather to stop a, a fired torpedo underwater until it ran out of its uh, compressed air fuel and would sink to the bottom. The second part of that was the surface barrier, which was essentially uh, floats or logs in some cases with a gate in the middle. This gate was attended by a, a gate vessel, which would open and close it as required to allow ships in or out of the harbor. We're standing uh, in a purpose-built emplacement for a, the duplex uh, six-pounder twin quick-fire gun that protected the mouth of the harbour in conjunction with a similar weapon emplaced over at Fort Rod Hill. Uh, this large circular area was where the gun sat. Uh, the crew would be protected by a, a, a gun house, like a little building over the top of the gun. Uh, and that's, uh, this structure behind me had a similar effect. Uh, to protect the crew against aerial attack. In the six months after Pearl Harbor, some 31 anti-aircraft guns were emplaced all around Victoria Esquimalt. And these were in public parks. A lot of the activity leaves no archaeological trace, like the passage of vessels through the ocean. Um, the submarine minefield was a vast cultural landscape across the mouth of the Narrows here, uh, for which very little evidence uh, remains. And you have to seek it out. You have to identify the fragments as touchstones to these extraordinary cultural landscapes that kept people busy for months on end. So these are the weights that held the submarine net down on the bottom, on the seabed. And they've just been pulled up here out of the way and forgotten ever since the end of the last war. This is a 12 pounder quick fire breech loading steel gun. This one's made in 1942, I see from the breech. And uh, today this is used as a saluting gun on Black Rock Battery. As far as I'm aware, they never fired a shot in anger. The, the, the biggest comment we usually get is the fact when they find out there was never any attack here, the reaction is, well, that was, that was kind of a waste of time and money, wasn't it? And I usually make the, the analogy about uh, having fire insurance on your house. Uh, you may not plan on having a fire, fire might happen, and you can't buy the insurance afterwards. So this fort and the other forts of the VE defenses really acted like a, a deterrent 
to enemies attacking, uh, potentially attacking the area. They, they were continuously effective throughout the time they were stood to as a deterrent, so they were 100% in action. The whole point of Fort Rod Hill was to defend the Esquimalt naval base, which originally, of course, was a British naval base, and these were British guns manned by British soldiers. Part of the agreement was that they would be then training the Canadian militia to take over these guns, as they did in 1906. And to me, this is part of an illustration of how Canada was growing uh, as a nation, taking responsibility more for its own defense. And in fact, towards the end of the story of Fort Rod Hill, we see that big shift from being a part of the British Commonwealth defense strategy to making our own defense agreements with the United States of America, which is just you know, 20 kilometers from where we're standing right now.